Hi, everybody. Welcome and thank you uh, for joining this year's Hurricane Awareness webinar series, where each week throughout the month of May, we will feature various topics as we prepare for the start of this year's hurricane season. My name is Catherine Egan. I'm NOAA's Southeast and Caribbean Regional Coordinator with NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, where we're focused on bringing together NOAA personnel and partners across the Southeast and Caribbean to improve the services that we provide to our communities. I co-lead NOAA's Southeast and Caribbean Regional Team, or CCART, who is the sponsor of this series. And CCART is one of eight regional collaboration teams across the country, working with both NOAA staff and partners throughout the US to foster strong collaborative ties and improve NOAA's regional capabilities and services. You can find out more information on CCART by following the link I will put in the chat momentarily. We're also going to put a link to our webpage where you can register for upcoming webinars in the Hurricane Awareness webinar series. So a few reminders for you all before we get started. All participants will be muted during the presentation, but please send us your questions in the chat box to answer at the end. Due to the large number of participants, some of the slides might be delayed. And finally, we will be recording this webinar and we will put the link to watch on our website after this series ends. All videos will include Spanish and English subtitles. <clears throat> with that, let's get started with our presentation today. So our presentation today is titled, The Power of Data Synthesis for Understanding the Effects of Coastal Hurricanes. Today's webinar is the third in our series and we'll be hearing from Dr. Chris Patrick with the HERS Network and the, um, with the HERS Network, yes. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Chris and then after that, I will pass it off to him to begin. So Dr. Chris Patrick is an associate professor at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, William & Mary, where he runs the Coastal and Estuarine Ecology Lab and is the lead PI and director of the Hurricane Ecosystem Response Synthesis Research Coordination Network. He's also the director of the Submerged, excuse me, Submerged, Submerged, pardon me, <laughs> Aquatic Vegetation Reg Restoration and Monitoring Program at VIMS and also the lead PI of Marine Geo in Virginia. He has a BS in Behavior, Evolution, Ecology, and Systematics from the University of Maryland College Park, and a PhD in Ecology from the University of Notre Dame, South Bend, Indiana. Prior to BIMS, Chris was a research scientist at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center from 2011 to 2004, an American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAS, Science and Technology Policy Fellow, who was placed with EPA Office of Water, Office of Science and Technology from 2014 to 2015, and an Assistant Professor of Marine Biology at Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi, where he developed and directed Marine Geo Texas. With over 45 peer-reviewed publications to his credit, recent relevant papers on the topic of hurricane impacts on coastal ecosystems include papers in estuaries and coasts, science advances, bioscience, and frontiers in ecology and the environment. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today, and I'll pass it off to you to give your presentation. All right, thank you. Thank you for having me, uh, and thank you to all of you that uh, joined us today to uh, hear me talk. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, tropical cyclones is what we're talking about. Um, they go by two names, hurricanes, typhoons, depending on uh, what hemisphere you're in. These are naturally occurring disturbances. Uh, they're warm core, low pressure systems uh, forming over uh, subtropical, tropical waters. And they've got this organized circulation. Um, and these are really important kinds of storms to be thinking about because they affect coastal regions. And coastal regions are where a large portion of our global population uh, exists and where the majority of global economic output occurs. Um, and when they strike these areas, they can cause quite a bit of damage. Um, since 1900, there's been over uh, $179 billion uh, in damage, uh, nearly a million deaths directly attributed to hurricane events. And so this problem is uh, something that's becoming more pertinent uh, in the era of global change. Um, so thinking about climate change, you know, we're looking at multiple degree temperature increases. Uh, we're seeing uh, rising sea levels. Um, and these effects, you know, it's not just something that's going to happen 100 years from now. This is something that we're seeing today. Uh, we, are have, we are experiencing climate change. We're seeing um, all these different climate disasters, fires, uh, 
thousand year floods, heat dome events. Um, I mean, the, the headlines have just been full of these climate change issues and it's gonna continue. And in the context of hurricanes, tropical cyclones, typhoons, um, we have both increasing uh, coastal populations now and uh, over the next century. And we are projected to see increases in the wind speed of uh, tropical cyclones, increases in rainfall, and increases in the areas that are affected. So storms being more frequent and occurring at higher intensity in higher latitudes where they used to be rarer. And so there's a number of things that we need to consider uh, as we sort of think about what are the possible effects of this. Um, so in terms of stressors, uh, winds are something that we need to think about. Freshwater inundation, so the amount of rainwater and, and flooding that occurs. Uh, storm surge coming off the coast. But then also things like how far you are from the eye wall of the storm, the timing of the event, um, and the conditions uh, that are present at the time of the event. Um, another thing that you know we don't often think about is you know how fast is the storm moving? If it's a really slow moving storm uh, like Florence over North Carolina, um, it has a lot more opportunity to drop lots and lots of rainfall. So the velocity of the storm itself is important. Um, and then finally, for these different areas of the world, um, the frequency at which events occur can dictate, to some extent, we think, how local areas would respond. So you know, here's an example of a pretty well-known storm, uh, Hurricane Agnes, which was in June of 1972. And this was a pretty unique event uh, because it was so early season, we don't usually see hurricanes uh, affecting the, the Northeast and mid-Atlantic United States uh, in June. And it had record amounts of rainfall in the upper Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, at that point, it was really a tropical storm, uh, but it still dumped a huge amount of rainfall and the highest flows ever recorded over the Conowingo Dam at the um, uh, uh, mouth of the Susquehanna uh, dropping into the Chesapeake Bay. And so some of the effects of this um, were some major impacts on submersed aquatic vegetation, seagrass. So um, the left uh, figure is showing the distribution of seagrass as submersed aquatic vegetation in 1970. On the right, this is 1975. This time series uh, is of a particular um, upper bay meadow, and you can see this big kind of crash um, right around the time that this tropical storm occurred. I mean, basically what happened was uh, the upper Chesapeake Bay was buried in sediment. And then all this fresh water came down and it killed a lot of marine life in the lower bay, uh, including SAV. And this was particularly damaging because it occurred before seed production occurred. Um, and so this had lasting impacts on SAV in this system uh, for years afterward. Uh, and so a lot of this really comes down to time. Uh, this storm would not have been as impactful if it had happened later in the season. So we have a lot of these examples um, of, of storms and how they impact um, coastal systems, but our general understanding is still fairly limited. And the reason for that is that a lot of the research that occurs is opportunistic. So we have a disaster of some sort uh, that occurs and researchers usually aren't planning for a hurricane study. And then it happens. Uh, they've got limited time to put together resources. Um, and when they are able to, uh, they often end up with something that we call a my system, my storm story. Uh, so a research effort which documents what happened in this, with this particular storm, this particular place, but doesn't really help put it in context of all the different storms and all the different things that are going on. So uh, kind of a one-off. Um, and so because there's been so many of these sort of uh, one-off studies that have happened, but not a whole lot of synthesis, there's been an increasing trend in people saying, we need synthesis. We need people to start working together and asking some bigger scale questions, not just examining a single event, uh, but trying to advance the, the, the study of ecosystem responses to hurricanes in general. Um, and so in addition to uh, the idea of trying to put together sort of uh, consortium monitoring efforts, there's immediate opportunities that exist using meta-analysis, which means uh, you take the data that's out there and you start putting it together to answer some bigger questions. Um, and there are some early examples of this. Um, so people have done some small scale kinds of synthesis, uh, looking at individual storm events, um, or maybe time series of storms in a single place. Um, notably, uh, Hans Perl has done a great deal of work on this uh, in the, uh, the Pamlico Sound area of uh, North Carolina. But one of the, uh, the, the 
shortcomings of some of these early synthesis efforts is that uh, so, some of them still remain fairly descriptive rather than quantitative. Um, and the quantitative examples are focused more on histories of a single place uh, rather than uh, big, broad scale, predictive, mechanistic, and broadly applicable uh, frameworks, predictive frameworks for understanding how and why uh, coastal systems respond to uh, various hurricanes as they do. Uh, and so one of the big barriers to synthesis uh, in, in science um, in, in this field is jargon. Um, we love jargon, scientists love jargon, and um, we have lots of different words uh, to describe uh, this thing called stability or uh, disturbance response. Uh, so this is an example from a paper that I like by Voker, uh, by Grimm and Whistle uh, called Babel or the Ecological Stability Discussions, an inventory and analysis of terminology and a guide for avoiding confusion. And this paper is over 20 years old now, uh, but you can see uh, they have lots of examples of uh, jargon in the literature describing stability. Um, and they try to sort of put this together into some subtopics and there's still, um, they came up with six different sort of clusters of terms, but then even within these six, there's lots and lots of different words that people are using interchangeably. Uh, and so this is a big issue. When you start trying to search the literature and pull together studies, um, if everyone's using different words, uh, how on earth are we supposed to put it all together? Um, and so, you know, breaking down some of these barriers, I mean, one thing that uh, was or maybe still is needed is a general framework common language, comparable measurements, uh, so that people are doing apples to apples comparisons. Um, and then, as I pointed out before, you know, we have all these sort of my system, my storm stories, um, and we need to be doing more to advance beyond that uh, and try to uh, advance theory. Um, so an underlying understanding laws and principles of how this stuff works. And so uh, the story of the HERS uh, network really starts in 2017, which was a pretty devastating hurricane season. So we had Harvey, Irma, and Maria were the two, were the three big ones. And at that time I was in Texas and, and I was affected directly by Hurricane Harvey, um, which came ashore um, in uh, Port Aransas. And so there was a whole lot of marine scientists, UTMSI, University of Texas Marine Science Institute, Texas A&M University Corpus Christi were right there. Um, and so, all of these different people were interested in asking the same question, you know, what happened to the coastal systems that I'm studying? Like each individual person was interested in, well, what happened to my system? Um, but we started looking across these different studies and said, you know, we're all asking the same question, but in slightly different ecosystems in the same place, maybe we could kind of pool together uh, and do some comparisons. Uh, and so these are some of the, uh, the primary projects that were involved with that. You can see that these were all NSF awards uh, through the RAPID uh, program, which is uh, a way to get money out quickly uh, to scientists in the wake of one of these disturbance events. So we ended up having data from barrier islands, estuaries, and coastal rivers. Um, and we had data from uh, hydrology, hydrographic variables, biogeochemistry, um, sedentary and mobile biota, the physical environment. So lo lots of different variables covered in this. Um, and, and we were able to kind of put some, together some of these graphs and look at you know, how fast did things uh, uh, return after they were disturbed. Um, so for example, here in the, 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 this, this figure here, this is uh, uh, Copano Bay, and you can see that uh, salinity crashed in the wake of the, uh, the event, and then it took uh, months to return because it's a fairly enclosed system. Whereas some of the other systems we looked at, it, it returned very quickly uh, because of uh, you know, tidal exchange um, allowing for rapid uh, return to high salinity levels. Um, and, and one of the first sort of interesting uh, synthesis things that we did with all this data is we started looking at the relationship between the magnitude of the effect um, and then also how long it took for things to come back to normal. And we looked at this across all of these different systems and response types, and we saw that there, there's a bit of a pattern, a negative relationship um, among of these variables uh, between the log of our response magnitude and the return time. So at that point, um, I started looking at what other people were doing with Irma and Maria, and I, con I made connections with these two characters, uh, John Kalinowski at FIU and Bill McDowell at UNH, and um, NSF was interested in more synthesis, um, and so we had uh, the three of us organize this big workshop in Corpus Christi in April, 2019. And we had 42 participants from the US and a few from beyond. Uh, our furthest traveler was from Taiwan. And um, 
you know, most of these people were recipients of rapids. Uh, NSF awarded over 50 rapids uh, in the wake of these, these hurricanes in that season. Um, and so everyone had these very similar sort of studies that they were doing. Um, and our goals were to share the data stories with each other, uh, try to put together conceptual models, and then start pooling our collected data to see if we could find some common patterns so that we could infer process from all this data that we were pulling together. And, and this is the, the kind of the first conceptual model that we put together. So we were looking at ecosystem return time to baseline and effect size. So, so how much did the system change? And so we, we think that you know, this is influenced by the strength of the storm, which is really a function of things like storm surge, wind speed, rainfall, storm speed. Um, and then these systems, they have something that we call like the average susceptibility. So you know, how susceptible are they to perturbation on average? Uh, through time, and this is constrained by things like the traits of the animals and plants that live there, um, and some of these things like uh, basin morphology, geomorphology, the attributes of the ecosystem. But then, and then this is also influenced by the hurricane regime. So how frequently are these systems um, impacted? But then there's another dimension to this, and that is susceptibility at the time of the event, because timing matters. Um, and so the average susceptibility, we think, informs susceptibility at the time of the event, but then other things, what we call antecedent conditions, like was it a drought year? Uh, was there a storm just the year before? Um, you know, was it a particularly wet spring? These things uh, can also influence um, how the system responds. Um, and there's a lot of connection and co-variation between all of this. And, and ultimately, we, we were thinking that the resistance and resilience of the system should modify this relationship between storm strength and response. And then it gets even more complicated because uh, you can start thinking about connectivity between systems. And then we start putting people into the model and we start thinking about, well, how does land use and the built environment modify these? Um, how does the socioeconomic uh, system stability? So the local economies, how stable are they in the response to the perturbation? And how does that relate to uh, the ecosystem stability? Are there feedbacks and connections between these um, affecting the resistance and resilience of uh, these, these socioeconomic systems. So this is a, um, a ridiculously complicated diagram. I fully admit that. But this is everything that we thought was important. Um, you know, putting these 42 people together, this is kind of like the brain dump. Um, and so we published that paper um, in 2020 in bioscience. And, and we uh, you know, made a few sort of small observations about comparisons between systems. But um, we really didn't have time at that point to process um, all of the data that we put together. And we put together a lot. Uh, we got information from everyone who came on uh, the baseline of their system for each variable that they're looking at. Um, and then we got information about how much the system changed in response to the perturbation and how long it took to come back to normal following the perturbation. And people had lots of data. I mean, not just from these, uh, from the HIM uh, hurricanes, but from lots of other hurricanes. Um, so the, the data started pouring in, and pretty soon we had this massive data set, thousands of time series, uh, each one that we were kind of boiling down into these simple metrics. Um, and this, this diagram on the left shows some of the key areas where we had a lot of data from, and overlaid on that are all these storm tracks, these tracks from storms that um, were part of this data set. And so the, the, the data set that we curated and assembled uh, included 26 named storms between 1986 and 2018, almost entirely from the Southeast uh, US, either the Gulf of Mexico or the, the Southern Atlantic, um, but with, with a few data from outside the US as well. Like I mentioned, we had someone from Taiwan to join us. Um, and lots of different kinds of systems from uh, estuaries primarily, but also rivers, wetlands, coastal systems, offshore and, and terrestrial systems lots of different classifications of uh, things that people were looking at, uh, and lots of different individual variables uh, included in this data set. So um, putting it all together, one of the things that um, we wanted to do was uh, put together um, a really kind of crisp mathematical conceptual framework. And this diagram here is, is, is that. Um, so we've got from the other diagram I showed you the intrinsic Resistance and resilience, um, that's kind of like the average, right? But then we have this observation here, um, and so this informs that, but then we have these uh, 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 other factors like 
uh, the change and the magnitude of the stressor uh, that are informing what we're observing. So th this is the framework that we're working with. And I'd be happy to talk more about it if, if folks are interested. Uh, but you know, the important thing is like, you know, what did we find? Um, so this diagram on the left, this shows the relationship between uh, resistance to wind speed, resistance to rainfall, and uh, resilience uh, uh, to uh, wind speed or resilience to rainfall. Um, and you can see that we've got this very clear pattern of negative covariation, similar to what we saw before, but now being analyzed in a different way. And now across uh, dozens of storms, thousands of uh, responses, lots of different ecosystem types, lots of variable categories. And it's, it's so um, persistently um, occurring, this pattern, that um, you know, we think that this might be kind of like a general law. And we also saw that it, for those systems where we had the right kind of comparable data, we see similar patterns. So for the freshwater systems, uh, these are different categories of variables. And you can see we've got this increasing pattern here of resistance and then a decreasing pattern of resilience. We see something similar in wetlands. Um, and, and so you know, what does this mean? Oh, and then I, we also looked at all these different uh, systems in terms of how they differed in their responses. And uh, without getting too much into the details, there's a lot of variation. Uh, different systems respond in different ways. Um, and there's a lot more to unpack um, in a data set of this magnitude. Uh, but going back to this negative uh, covariation pattern, um, one, you know, we think that this is repeated enough that it, it might actually approach something like a law of which there are very few in ecology. Um, but why does it exist? Well, we, we think that evolution is, is the best explanation for this. And that is simply that um, you tend to optimize. Organisms tend to optimize in one way or another. And so if you're putting all of your selection pressure into being very resistant to a disturbance, something like structural complexity um, or structural compounds in plants, uh, those uh, organisms also tend to take longer to grow to maturity and, and maybe don't reproduce as quickly um, as uh, other, other kinds of plants, ones that might grow much more quickly and be much more adapted to disturbance. And so there's this trade-off between either maximizing fitness on a uh, resistance axis or maximizing resistance um, uh, on a resilience axis. So what that means in effect is that it's hard to be good at both. And, and in retrospect, that shouldn't surprise anyone uh, that um, kind of has some good knowledge of biology and, and evolution. Uh, we don't tend to see animals and plants that are good at everything. Uh, they tend to optimize in certain directions. And so that uh, naturally creates patterns like the one that we're looking at. Um, but there's a management implication here. And that is, you know, you'll often hear people talking about how we need to be managing for increased coastal resistance and increased coastal resilience. And it might not be possible, at least at fine scales, uh, to do both well at the same time. Um, and that's and that I think is a is a pretty interesting take home uh, uh, from this work. Um, the analysis also uh, revealed that we've got a lot of holes in our data set. So we didn't have a lot of data on ecosystem functioning. We had less data on the mobile fauna, and we didn't have a whole lot of terrestrial responses uh, in the data set that we put together. Um, and so, um, you know, we've really scratched the surface with these data and also scratched the surface with um, uh, uh, the data that we didn't get that's out there. So, for example, there is a lot of forest data that's out there. We just didn't have the right group uh, that was putting it together and contributing it to us. Um, and so going back to this, this call to action, this need for consortium, you know, this is the time uh, we need to be doing this. Um, and this initial effort really showed that we can get a lot done using the data that's in hand. Um, and so the uh, HERS, uh, Hurricane Ecosystem Response Synthesis Research Coordination Network, uh, was developed as a platform for advancing this work um, and, and trying to address this need of continuing on. And so the steering committee for this project um, includes myself, John Kamenowski, and Bill McDowell, uh, but also Beth Staffer at University of Louisiana Lafayette. Um, and these are all co-PIs on the project. Um, but then we also have some other folks, um, Amy Hensel, uh, Carrie Fritz and Peter Edwards from Kew, David Lagamassino from VCU, um, sort of helping sort of 
uh, expand out the knowledge base of the folks that are uh, organizing this effort. Um, and so one of the first things that we uh, identified kind of putting things together is that, you know, we really need to change the way uh, that we fund hurricane research in the natural sciences. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, RAPID is a major funding mechanism, uh, it's National Science Foundation funding, which allows people to get out there and study an event after it happens. Uh, but it's very hard to ask for money in advance um, and plan for a hurricane, which may or may not happen. And that has to do with how the funding structures are, are developed, uh, the time horizons, and the acceptable risk. But really, we need to be moving in that direction. Um, because if we rely only on reactive funding, we're going to be uh, uh, always getting these my system, my storm, one-off stories. And if we want to start doing coordinated experiments to advance our understanding, uh, we need to uh, start planning out experiments um, in advance. Uh, and there are ways to do this. So this uh, figure on the right, uh, this is showing a uh, hurricane return interval along the, uh, the east coast of the United States and the Gulf Coast of the United States. And you can see that uh, some places get hit by storms quite a bit more frequently than other places. Um, and so these three key areas that we identified, um, they've got return intervals of you know, roughly five years, uh, which means that yeah, we don't know precisely when a hurricane is going to hit one of these places, nor the exact year it's going to hit, but we can be pretty sure that in the next five years, one of these places is probably going to get hit by a hurricane of some sort, and, and certainly um, on a decadal scale. And so it's not infeasible to start uh, planning uh, uh, studies or experiments uh, for storms that haven't happened yet. Yes, we don't know when they're going to happen precisely, but we've got a pretty good guess about the time horizons and the locations where they're likely to occur. Um, so that was one uh, early thing that's come out of this. Um, but another thing that we're doing is uh, we're pushing um, uh, synthesis to answer uh, some of these big questions. And the really big question, the one that we're very interested in, is what drives the resistance and resilience of coastal systems, both natural and anthropogenic, to tropical cyclone events? Um, and we've broken this down into three themes of investigation. So one, our ecosystem uh, uh, characteristics and antecedent conditions. Um, so what's going on before the storm hits? Another one is really focused on uh, eco-evolutionary history, life history, biodiversity. Um, and then the third one is focused on feedbacks between natural and socioeconomic systems uh, and their shared resistance and resilience to tropical cycles. And so I wanted to share one of the more recent efforts that's come out of this. Um, and this is coming out of the, um, uh, the Eco Evo Biodiversity uh, Working Group, uh, which met for the first time in person uh, last winter. And now these projects are starting to mature a bit. And you can see that a lot of different scientists um, have been involved with this effort. Um, and, and so what I wanted to share with you today was some investigations into biodiversity. So. There's a lot of literature out there that shows that biodiversity has positive effects on various kinds of ecosystem functions or processes, the things that the system does. And one of those is stability. And this has been well shown in things like grasslands. Um, so this, this figure here is showing um, plots of, uh, of, of different diversity of plants uh, in Minnesota, one of the longest ongoing biodiversity experiments uh, in the world. Um, so we know that about uh, these terrestrial plant systems, but you know what about in the context of hurricanes? Um, so you know, we have these enhancing stressors, including hurricanes, and so can biodiversity help buffer the system, um, increase its resistance or its resilience to hurricane disturbance? Um, and so we also I had identified earlier that in our first pass our, our first attempt at synthesis, we discovered we didn't have a lot of mobile uh, animal data, so moving animal data. And so we were really wanted to focus on coastal fishes because that was a big deficiency in the data set. Um, and there's a lot of good reasons to look at coastal fishes because they're diverse, um, we've got spatial variation in their composition, there's lots of life histories, and there is lots of monitoring in the US, we just missed it in our first pass. Um, and so we looked at uh, what are called fisheries independent monitoring data sets. So these are data sets where um, uh, state agencies are going out and they're using trawl surveys uh, to survey fishes um, uh, monthly or even higher frequency uh, during the growing season. 
And so we were able to put together this data set uh, that spans from the late 70s to the mid, mid 20, uh, 2010s. Um, and for each one of the sites that we included in the analysis, uh, there's about 20 plus years of data um, present. The whole data set contains 400 unique fish species. Um, and all of these had monthly surveys that were replicated within months and used similar collection methods. So there's a lot of comparability here. Um, and our idea was to use these time series uh, and connect that to the NOAA hurricane uh, databases uh, to intersect the time series in these places with storms that have happened and build a large data set to answer some of these questions that we're interested in. Um, and so the big one here is, does biodiversity increase community resilience across hurricane intensity? And what are some of these general relationships look like? Um, and are there trends uh, through time in the fish communities in, uh, in terms of enhancing hurricane resilience? So two of the key findings uh, from the data synthesis are that one, uh, we, we see that as the richness of these or the number of species um, uh, in these systems increases, we do tend to see greater resilience to hurricanes. Uh, and, and we also see that places that are hit by storms more frequently they also bounce back more quickly. Um, and so these are like two, uh, two things which sort of match theory, uh, places which are under strong selection for resilience are showing it. Um, and we also see some trends in this through time. So hurricane frequency is increasing and we're seeing uh, increases through time uh, in some of these responses. So putting this together, um, you know, this is how we think the world works, at least in the context of this of this study. Uh, you know, storm frequency is affecting the diversity that's present at the site and the diversity that we actually observe in these trawls. Um, and that is having feedbacks to resistance and resilience, which then feeds back around to diversity. Um, so we have these feedback loops that are occurring. Um, and, and so both diversity and storm frequency, again, are pretty important um, characteristics or, or factors in understanding um, these, how variation in these systems occurs. We also see that the systems that appear to be most resilient tend to have a particular suite of taxa. So there's three families of fishes in particular, um, which are um, most common in the sites that have the highest resilience, so the angrolids, the cupids, and the cyanids. Uh, or the drums. Um, and so we also were started looking at traits. Um, and I can't dig too far into the details on our, our trait work, um, but this is some work that uh, Ryan James and Orlando Santos, uh, part of our network um, at FIU, have been doing. And they were looking at, on average, uh, what is the functional trait diversity? So how, how diverse is the suite of traits present in the fishes uh, before, in the blue, versus after storms in the red um, across these different regions of the, the Gulf Coast and the East Coast. And you can see there's a lot of different kinds of patterns here. So like big increases, maybe no change, maybe a decrease. So from place to place, we're seeing very different kinds of responses. When we break this into um, more of a metric where either like increasing is above the line, decreasing is below the line, um, and then we relate that to storm frequency. One of the things that popped out was that as storm frequency increases, uh, we're seeing these sites tend to respond with enhanced post-storm functional diversity. So the fish communities in frequently disturbed sites tend to be very diverse at following storms, um, which is suggestive of um, a, um, uh, some kind of insurance or functional diversity um, uh, uh, redundancy metric uh, with, with other taxes sort of stepping up and expanding the diversity of the system uh, to maintain function. So some of the take-homes from this work thus far are that one, we definitely show that uh, the diversity and also um, we see that abundance um, of resilient fishes can enhance community recovery rates um, and that hurricane frequency may act as a selection filter on resiliency. Um, and that particular suites of taxa um, also are associated with resistance uh, and resilience to these, these, uh, these disturbances. Um, and they can enhance the diversity of traits present in these communities following disturbances. Uh, so some of the implications of this are that one, 
we're seeing evidence that systems are showing uh, some adaptation uh, to increase storm frequencies, uh, which is good. That, that's great news. Um, another one is that there's some fisheries management uh, implications here. So one uh, is that um, if we can manage for uh, enhanced diversity, if we can manage for uh, a particular suites of taxa, uh, we can potentially manage for higher resilience uh, to hurricanes. Uh, so that's something that you know, we could actually you know, put our finger on the scale um, and, and push things in a particular direction. So um, going back to the, uh, the themes of the network, um, this one in the bottom, uh, feedbacks between natural and socioeconomic systems, this is the one that we're currently uh, launching and focused on. Our first big in-person workshop is going to happen next week uh, in Washington, D.C. at FIU's um, uh, meeting space there. Um, and so we've assembled a group of uh, anthropologists, economists, sociologists, uh, with some ecologists, and we're going to be trying to hash out uh, those conceptual models a bit more and see if we can't start connecting the dots between some of these ecosystem uh, things that we've been focused on and uh, socio social systems with a big focus on fisheries um, and also uh, coastal uh, uh, hazards uh, like storm surge and uh, built infrastructure, uh, things like that. Um, so that, that's where the network is going. Um, but we're not done. This project is going to go for a few more years, and um, we want you to get involved. Um, we have a number of different activities that we run throughout the year. Um, so we have um, a, a webinar series that's going to be launching again in the fall, where uh, these are going to be research uh, presentations by uh, different folks that are involved with the network, either presenting network, uh, inspired research, network funded research, or just stuff that's interesting uh, to folks um, in the network. Um, we also have our, our database that we've been assembling and we want people to access it and use it. Uh, and we also were interested in your data. If you've got data that is uh, relevant to this, uh, you can let us know. Um, and you can sign up for our, our, our listserv and get email updates about what's going on. You can follow us on Twitter. Um, and um, yeah, so if you're interested in this, uh, we encourage you to check out the website and to sign up for updates. So uh, my final thoughts on this are that one, you know, climate change is happening now. Um, and we're changing the baseline conditions of ecosystems. We're changing the structure and function of ecosystems. And we are thereby altering uh, their resistance and resilience to these perturbations, in particular hurricanes. Um, at the same time, we're changing the frequency and intensity um, of tropical cyclones. And so, you know, for these reasons, it is critically important that we have a mechanistic, detailed understanding of what controls resistance and resilience uh, in these coastal systems from what I'll call genes to ecosystems, organizational um, uh, scales. Um, and then also a different spatial and temporal scales. Uh, there's simply a lot that we don't know that we need to know uh, because the world is changing rapidly and, and to keep pace with it, uh, we need to have a, a playbook, a, guide, a guidebook for um, understanding what the implications and consequences of those changes are. Um, which, yes, this, I think that's what it says there on the bottom, something like that. Uh, so lots of different co-authors and collaborators have contributed. Uh, to this work. Lots of different institutions have been involved. Um, and uh, I think I just want to stop now and take questions and, and once again acknowledge uh, the National Science Foundation for, uh, for funding this work. Excellent presentation, Chris. Thank you so much. Um, I was just thinking we'll have to bring you back next year to hear more about the socioeconomic component of the HERS network. So I hope your workshop is successful next week and and again that we can hear about it come next year's hurricane awareness webinar series yeah that'd be great all right um folks if you have questions go ahead and put them in the questions box and we can go through them um so while our audience members are thinking of their questions and actively typing them right now i actually have a question for you chris um uh the it was really interesting what you were saying about reactive funding versus proactive funding for understanding resistance and resilience to hurricanes. And I was wondering if um, 
you received any kind of response? And if so, um, what did you see for your call for proactive funding for this kind of work? Yeah, so that paper uh, was published um, about a year, year ago, year and a half ago now. Um, and actually, before we uh, published it, I, uh, I ran it, I ran it through NSF to make sure that there were no factual inaccuracies about the funding mechanism. So our, our program uh, manager uh, floated around the office, and uh, I mean, I, I cannot speak for them um, because I'm not part of the National Science Foundation. But I think that well, one, they said that there was nothing factually inaccurate in what we said um, about how the funding mechanisms work, and I think that there's interest. I mean, I talking with program officers one-on-one, -on -one, I think that there's a recognition that these are problems um, and there is interest in uh, trying to address these. Um, and actually, after the workshop we're having next week, um, I'll be meeting with our new program uh, manager um, and some other program officers. And they were interested in chatting with us about the paper and talking more about what some of our ideas are. Um, and I know that you know over the past decade, there's been some other folks at NSF, some of whom aren't there anymore, that have floated different ideas on um, how to address uh, some of these, these problems uh, with the funding model. I think that RAPID's a great funding model. I don't think it should go away um, because there's always gonna be a need for something happened, we didn't expect it. We need to go uh, jump out there and collect some data. So that, that's a really valuable model. Um, but extreme events, you know, they're not really, as extreme anymore they're they're happening with such frequency these days that like they're part of the normal uh you know what's happening and um and they're not really as unpredictable as you might think up front there are some hot spots for this um uh, where we can be doing more in terms of proactive uh planning but the biggest issue is you know a lot of these federal funding uh cycles i mean they're really like five years and i, I think to pull off something like this uh, for hurricanes, uh, you might really want more like a 10-year window because you're not exactly sure when it's going to happen and you need some time before and after. So, um, you know, that really just involves kind of thinking outside the box about a, a different way to, to fund that kind of work. Thanks so much, Chris. I appreciate that insight. Super, again, very interesting, not something that I think we really think about a lot. Um, but I have one question that is coming in now. Um, says, do we want a resistant community or a resilient community? The question came after reading a perspective from Isabella Cote and Emily Darling on coral reefs and our effect of restoring corals that are resilient but sensitive to heat. Yes, yeah, this, this, is, a, this is a great question because, um, and we're seeing it in lots of different systems. Um, uh, and that, that coral heat, I mean, that same story is playing out in the Chesapeake Bay with seagrasses, which that's something else I work on. So we've been uh, moving from eelgrass dominated to widgeon grass dominated systems. And the widgeon grass can handle the heat stress better, but man, it's wimpy. It, 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 it does not respond well to uh, spring storms um, in the same way that, that um, uh, eelgrass does. And so, you know, really it's a value judgment, um, uh, which one's better. Uh, and, and the magnitude of these swings also matters. But generally speaking, a system that's very, very resilient is probably going to be less, um, uh, I hate to use the word stable, but I'm going to say stable. It's, gonna, it, it's, it's less likely to be really stable or consistent, persistent through time. So uh, uh, systems that can bounce back really quickly also tend to have characteristics that allow them to crash very quickly, which leads to um, high variability from year to year. Um, and and that, that's not necessarily a good thing, right? I mean, especially if you were talking about like fishery stocks, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the people that are out there um, harvesting, they probably would not appreciate if some years there's tons out there and then some years there's very little out there. Um, it's hard to kind of have a, a livelihood built around. People want some consistency. So, you know, I think that um, generally people would probably more appreciate resistance uh, then resilience, um, but there are points where if we cannot have systems that are resistant enough uh, to weather events at a frequency that um, is acceptable, then we kind of have to go in the other direction. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we had another question come in. How much does the HERS network look at research cases on resilience within ecosystems and communities outside of the US? 
That's a great question. Um, so because we are US based, um, the majority of our membership um, are within the United States, although we have been uh, making some inroads into uh, the Caribbean, Central America. Um, I think we've got more membership uh, there than anywhere else. Um, and then in terms of uh, uh, beyond, uh, you know, we've tried reaching out and advertising uh, more internationally uh, to Southeast Asia, Africa, Europe. Uh, we've gotten some response, but um, I think uh, for webinars in particular, the uh, time, time difference is a problem. Uh, that, that's, that's one challenge. Uh, but in terms of uh, pulling data uh, for this, a lot of the data that we pulled together was uh, uh, submitted, contributed by folks that are involved with the network. So to some extent, the data that we have from those kinds of efforts are reflective of the, the geographic distribution of the people involved. Um, and then the, uh, the fisheries data that I was presenting, again, that's all United States-based data because that's something that we, uh, we had easy access to. Um, so what we really do need is um, a more global synthesis uh, because there's some really interesting differences when you look internationally um, across these different areas. One of the biggest interesting like, case study comparisons that came out of some of the early work was comparing the forests of Taiwan to the forests of Puerto Rico, um, which have been uh, impacted by uh, Hurricane Maria. So we had these dueling data sets from these two different uh, tropical regions uh, separated across the planet uh, that had nice uh, biogeochemistry data from the rivers and streams. And one of the things that popped out um, is that in, in uh, Puerto Rico, uh, after they get hit by a hurricane, uh, there is years of elevated nutrients present in the systems. Um, so all of this downed litter material decomposing, it just sort of uh, saturates the, um, the groundwater and, and the watershed has elevated nutrient levels uh, for, for five, six years afterward. In uh, these, uh, these systems in, in Taiwan that we were comparing them to, they show no signal like that. Um, and they also have lots and lots of, of, uh, of storms coming through, a much higher frequency than Puerto Rico. And so we were thinking that probably um, it's just, it, it's all been washed out. Like there's, there's not, that, that same kind of retention isn't there. Um, but it's just a one-to-one -one comparison to systems. In order to really uh, make a generalization, you know, we need dozens, we need dozens of these places. Um, and uh, in order to get uh, wide variation, things like storm frequency, uh, you know, we need a, a wide geography. Uh, so it's it's definitely something that's needed. Very interesting question. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, I actually don't have any other questions for you, but if folks on the call think of some later, um, you can reach out to Chris through the HERS website. So it's up here on the screen, or you can also reach out to me and I'll forward your information along to Chris. So that's, uh, you can reach me at region.secarib at noaa.gov. Um, and so with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up our webinar today. So thank you all so much for joining the third installment of the 2024 Hurricane Awareness webinar series. Um, and Chris, thank you so much again for presenting today uh, for us. This is super interesting work. And like I said, we're looking forward to bringing you back next year to hear how the network has progressed in that time. Um, for folks on the line, our next webinar will be on May 23rd. So that's next week at 1 p.m. Eastern time and is titled Planning for the Unplanned, Responding to Marine Debris After Disasters, presented by Jessica Conway of NOAA's Marine Debris Program. So the link for that is in the chat. If you go up to the um, website I dropped here on our Hurricane Awareness webinar series, the registration links on that page. Um, and if you are interested in knowing more, again, don't hesitate to reach out. So with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up, wrap up our webinar. So thanks everyone for joining. Yeah, thank you.